Or maybe it's not going to. Oh, yeah, it is. Okay, yeah, we are. Don't think we're live. It says we're live, but there's not like, look at my mob thing is there's no connections. It's not working. Okay. We're live. Yeah. Uh, to somebody, we're live to each other. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll just do my little bit of an intro, Seb, and then, um, and then I'll let you introduce yourself. Yeah? Cool. Yeah, sounds great. Okay, guys, and welcome to another podcast. Now, this is a live strip back raw interview that I am doing. Um, I lo love to have guests on my podcast that can help with leveling up, scaling up business. I like to hear true life stories on how people have pivoted post COVID as well. Um, and Seb actually joined me about two and a half years ago. Um, I think it was during lockdowns and made some massive change in his business. So I want to touch on where he is now with that. But you, Seb is an award-winning entrepreneur, global business as he has many, he wears many hats. Won't say he's the jack of all trades, but he wears many hats in terms of business. And I think this is going to be so valuable for you guys listening um, to hear his story. And we're going to touch on also being ubiquitous. So I want to introduce you to Se Sebastian Bates. I call you Seb, but Sebastian Bates, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Great to be here. Great. Now, Seb is joining us from Dubai. So I think it's nighttime where you are, isn't it? It's 3 p.m., quarter past oh, 3. 3 so we, do you know what? It doesn't really get dark here till quite late. So um, when, I, when I was in England, I was really surprised, especially my kids were quite surprised how how uh, how dark early it gets and how dark you know late in the morning it is as well. So over here, we've pretty much got sun all the time. <laughs> and you was only here quite recently, wasn't you? Yeah, here in the summer. So we were yeah. sort of a couple of months just traveling around Europe in the summer and a bit of time in the UK, just getting in, getting into the um, UK life a little bit and seeing friends and family and stuff. So that was nice. Fabulous. You'll not like it now, though, because we seem to have just clicked that switch where yeah. now we're uh, half past seven at night, it's starting to get dark and it's not nice. I hate it. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so no, it's, it's one of those things, isn't it? <laughs> it is. So, Seb, I want you to introduce yourself. Obviously, I've done a little bit of an intro, but I want you to introduce yourself on who you are, what you do, and just tell us a bit about yourself, you and your businesses. Yeah, cool. So, my name is Sebastian Bates. Um, I'm the founder of the Warrior Academy, which is a, a global martial arts organization that specializes in character development for young people. So, ultimately, what that means is we transform young lives by developing their confidence, conduct, concentration, giving children a black belt character that essentially sets them up for a happy and successful life um, as an adult. Uh, we teach around 4,000 kids every single week across three continents. Uh, started 13 years ago in a little village in Somerset. Um, now we're, we're in six different um, countries and 11 different cities and have nine offices around the world and a team of 60 running it all. And we've won, we've won lots of awards for what we do in terms of transformations and stuff like that. So it's, uh, it's definitely been a journey. And most of that journey has happened since COVID in the last three years, actually. So it's yeah. uh, it's been a wild wild time uh, which since is we last really spoke. interesting because obviously a lot of people think well you know why would i get you on my podcast because you predominantly are in the the sector of you know building young carrots and everything else but i think what's really important is how you actually did that because that is still mm. a um that is still a business where people pay to come through your door you are performing or you are doing your character building and you're coaching them then they leave but obviously, COVID changed a lot for you. And obviously, we touched this on. Well, well, when we spoke last, you was making the changes because it was within lockdown. So yeah. what what clicked for you when you thought, you know what, this, this needs to change? So lockdown for me, I, COVID hit me twice from a business perspective, right? So we were, we were I, was, I was in Africa. I was in Johannesburg doing a course with Dr. Martini. you probably heard of. Yes, I'm total legend, it. right? Love so, was, if, if you know, if you know Dr. D. Martini, you know that he's pretty full on with his content. Um, I was doing the breakthrough um, workshop with him, and um, essentially, I, while, while I was there, I got a it was sort of 15 hour days studying, right? So, pretty hardcore. Day one of being you know, on this course, three day course, I got a message from my wife, who was eight months pregnant in Dubai, saying that uh, that they have. Um, closed down all of our clubs because of COVID. So basically the health department came to our clubs and just put signs up and said, everyone go home. And um, so, you know, that was, that was kind of the first time we thought, ah, we, you know, we've now got to shift online. So immediately I, you know, finished the course, came back and our entire business was shut down. 
So we had staff, we had bills to pay. We had, I had a family, a young family with one child and one on the way. Um, and we had no income at all. Uh, there was no furlough or grants or any of that in Dubai. So if you lost your business, you're out of the country. That's it. If you can't earn money here, you're gone. So wow. it's, it's very, very brutal. Um, but within 10 days, I, I filmed 140 hours of content and created one of the world's largest um, online martial arts uh, courses. It takes eight years to go through our online program. And basically, it's every single class from white belt to black belt um, within our program. So we managed to, to transition a lot of students in Dubai online. And then, um, of course, the UK, it kind of hit later. But they were looking at us saying, oh, it's just that, that thing from China. It won't go any further. We're kind of stop in the Middle East, just right? Like a little bat. Was and, it a bat or a rat? Was there? I don't know. It's just that little thing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I would just, you know, whatever it is. And so um, I said to the team, no, we've got, to, we've got to basically prepare for Armageddon. You know, you've got to assume the worst. And so we did. And we built these phases into um, our strategy for dealing with COVID. And we executed that perfectly in the UK. We were the first to show up for our community, the first to do online courses, the first to do this, the first to do that. And so, you know, I, I realized with all the chaos that was going on around me, the industry I was in had a cap to what we could actually do. There's only so much you can do for, for your customers, right? Yeah. And going out and seeking new customers would have been like reinventing the wheel and quite a different thing to actually try and do at that time. So I actually created a few different businesses during COVID. So during, during lockdown, which in Dubai was, it was quite heavy, especially the first few months, um, I created about three different businesses. Um, and they all became six figure businesses, which is quite interesting. Um, one of them was building online courses. So my strategy was rather than, you know, I've already built an online course with the help of a, an award-winning um, production house in Dubai, a good friend of mine owns that. So I thought, well, why don't we partner up? So partnership was a huge part of what we did and we can sell online courses to people. So we had, you know, people who had very physical businesses, you know, wine tasting companies, physiotherapists, yoga instructors, and so on. Um, who who didn't know how to sell their product and they were they were finished their business was about to collapse so we then came in resuscitated their business with this online course and within seven days we went from filming them to launching their course and then teaching them how to sell and execute and so you know I think we made sort of twenty thirty thousand pounds a month from doing that uh, which was just incredible in the first the first two weeks um, when yeah. we launched that business the other business then was uh, was um, a, a business called Shield, which I started with Jason. Uh, yeah. And that, that, was, that was really remarkable because we, I, you know, I, I said to Jason, look, uh, I've got all of these amazing um, part-time freelancers who make all my content. And right now, I, I don't really have any work for them. And so I might have to let them go. And he said he's kind of in the same position with some of his team. So I said, well, why don't we just bring them all on board full-time so we can secure their jobs and then why don't we build a product for entrepreneurs to help them scale their businesses online and get their, get their name and face out there and build trust with their communities yeah. at, the same, at the same time as providing that employment for our teams. And so, um, you know, we, we, we did a lot of polls into business groups and that sort of stuff. And we realized that ultimately people were spending too much money, too much time, and they weren't getting the impact, right? And, yeah. and I know that you've been a, a Shield customer. I think you're one of the uh, first yeah, ones, right? Yeah. This is and do, a, do you remember? Do you remember the sign up for Shield? The, 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 when we when we launched it with the webinar, I can't remember. It was oh, in the middle of COVID. It was May 2020, and we had something like you know 20 people sign up or something, and it was, we made about 25,000 pounds in one hour from the day of launch to day seven. So the day of I, the concept came to mind. We had the conversation on day one, day seven webinar, bang. And ultimately, it comes down to just asking the market what they want and then producing something which is win-win for everyone. Yep. Um, and suddenly we had all these, you know, that became a six-figure business. It was like, so if you understand how to find your customers' problems, you know, create a solution, package it up properly and make it desirable and then sell it, you, you've got the ability to yes. be so resilient in COVID. And so you know, I, I was doing that and then I was doing that and then I was doing mentoring with business. And suddenly I was in this office here just creating all these different businesses. And my wife then gave birth. And I, you know, at that time, I was then able to, <laughs> then able to Stop being to selfish wife. Baby. And so, <laughs> yeah, I was like, keep it down over there. I'm trying to, I'm trying to make businesses there. <laughs> Not all so, about uh, it, was a, it was a wild time. You know, I look back at that, I'm like, oh man, that was, that was really stressful. But it was also yeah. so amazing. Like from a yeah. creative point of view, 
it was like, as an entrepreneur, I really came to life with that and I really enjoyed it. Um, and then so September, gone, September 2020 yeah. came along and my core business is the Warrior Academy, right? So this mm -hmm. is, this is what, like my, my core vision and mission is empowering young people. That's what I, that's what I live for. Um, and so I've done that for the last 13 years. And so September 2020, everyone was running out of commercial real estate like it was a burning building, right? Especially in Dubai, where it's quite expensive. And we saw it as an opportunity. So we said, you know, I kind of assumed, I think COVID, you know, I think they'll start relaxing the rules and, you know, by the end of this year. So we said, right, we're going to be the first to reopen and schools won't let you in schools didn't let anyone you know do martial arts or whatever for the first year nor did all these other places you couldn't rent halls all this sort of stuff so we said sod it we're just going to go in and we're going to we're going to take over an office and we're going to convert it into a dojo so we went into one office converted it into a dojo got a really good rate because it was covid and the whole place the whole building was basically derelict there was no one in there and now it's completely full like 200 units in this office completely full and we've got seven of them and so we, we literally went with one office and I, I, I said, right, we want this office, but we also want first refusal on the offices next door. Yeah. So as soon as we started growing, we could then take over that one, take over that one. And that's what we did. And so within uh, two and a half years from September 2020 till um, December um, 2022, we went from 200 students to over, over a thousand students just in that one center in Dubai. We became wow. the largest martial arts academy in the Middle East for kids and um you know the business scaled into a into a multiple seven-figure business because of that one move during covid yeah. you know so that was a really important like with, yeah with your story what's really important i think i think timing was for you to be doing the dr d martini uh, breakthrough course yeah just as COVID was about to hit that that obviously in terms of your mindset would have set you up to... Do you know what? It's funny because I'm in that I'm in that course and I'm thinking, oh my god, you know, is this the? It's such a heavy course, right? If you've been to, you ever seen his stuff? He's standing there and he's he's a million miles an hour talking and he's just like giving you and your head's exploding because yeah. it's such incredible content and you're like you're questioning the meaning of life while you're sitting there and you're like, <laughs> yeah. oh my god. And, Even you know, and, then, and then you get a text that. message saying, you, you know, all your your whole business is being shut down. And then I was like, I'm either in the world's worst place or the world's best place. Yeah. to deal with this issue right and you know that the issue that i was dealing with was all about perception and all about mindset and it was like well actually you know they were, they were asking me so many deep questions and i was like do you know what my head's in another place right now i'm thinking about this but it's good to you know to yeah. have those and sort I of people around you while you're doing it yeah i think it's incredible i think the main thing that you know like people I think a lot of people don't seem to understand that the even a lot of people are blaming COVID, obviously, for the failure of businesses. OK. Yeah. And people didn't look for opportunities. They didn't look for opportunities. They didn't look at the fact that your the kids that you coach still needed you. Yeah. They couldn't have you the old school way. So how can you be there for them and how can you give them something without yeah. the way that we've been taught? I mean, the way, the way I saw it was, you know, the, the, the problems just changed. Yeah. Everyone's problems have changed. And so the first one who can identify and understand the problems is the one who will be able to serve the customers the quickest, who is the one exactly. who gets through it. And exactly. so we just, we just, you know, we phoned up every customer every month just to have a chat. We were like, how are you doing? How are you coping with it? And all this sort of stuff. And, and I think... A, that gave us really valuable insights into what people and parents especially were actually going through. But B, we showed up for our community when, you know, a lot of other places didn't, right? Yeah. And, you know, that, and this that is really where, helped us. Yeah, this is where your passion and the love for your industry made you do that. Because a lot of people think, well, I'm not going to earn no money. So, um, you mm. know, I'm not going to earn any money by making them phone calls, by sitting down and ringing my two, 300 students. Yeah. I'm not going to be directly getting any money from that. So, yeah. But if you've got a true passion in something, you just want to serve people and you want to character build these children, then mm. the goal is bigger than that. And yeah, I think and, and, and that's exactly it. I think, it's, I think it's having a long game, a long vision. Yeah. And this is one of the things I always say uh, to, the, to the people I mentor through business mentoring. You know, I say that it's, they, they need to tie their, the reason they exist to, to a reason beyond making money. And yeah. it's, it's so that when you look back, if you've got a bad financial year, you're not suddenly in a position where you're like, well, that was a terrible year because that could have been your best year of impact, yes. right? You could have had the best stories from clients or work with some incredible people and you changed their life. Even yeah. if it was just one person, that year then could have been worth it. And so, you know, I, I, we've, we've had good years, we've had bad years. Um, and it's, it's ultimately, 
the way in which you perceive what it is you're there to do, right? Are you just there to make money? That's fine. And for a lot of people, that's what they want to do. And they, they find some fulfillment in that. But um, for us, it's like there's, there's something much deeper driving us. And that's, that's where the whole charity side and the philanthropy work that I do started really kicking off when I started to realize that, why, why we exist. Mm. Yeah, no, definitely. I think that's where, that's where in the beauty industry, a lot of people fall flat and it is all about chasing, chasing the clients, getting booked in next week, thinking, right, okay, I've got that rent coming out. So right, I need these clients yeah. in. And, you know, like my goal is much bigger than that. You know, I, I want to change the mindset of beauty entrepreneurs and let them realize that you study for so long, you've got so much knowledge to share, whether it is with the skin aesthetics or beauty or whatever. How can you, how can you get your message out there to people in your audience and not even, not even think about the money It's it's all about, you know, you setting yourself as a go-to or a celebrity in your field, you know, and getting your message out there to change the way the industry is. Um, And when you truly focus on that, the money then will come in, you know. Yeah, if, you, if you've got if you've got trust and you've got a community, you've got an audience who trust you and value you, and you're giving them lots of value, then you're in a position to monetize that, right? You can you can and you should eventually um, charge for the value you give, and that's yeah. fair trade. Yeah, you know, but it's a lot of that. The, this this is this is where the trust building phase is so important. You can't just go from zero to sales. You've got to go from you know zero to building trust to making people aware of you and then sales, right? And that's the mistake a lot of people make. Yeah, definitely. So talking about Shield and Ubiquitous. So I'm a customer of yours and have been for two, three years. Um, what is it all about and what, what, why, obviously, you, you created that because you obviously wanted to kind of save the jobs of these people that you was freelancing. Yeah. Um, but what is, what is it all about? So ubiquitous is, it means to be everywhere at once. And this, it basically summarizes the biggest challenge that most entrepreneurs face, which is that they've got a great product or service, but no one knows about them, right? Yeah. There's no point in being the world's best you know, beautician if no one knows who you are and what you do. You know, you, you, if you've only got a few customers who actually hear, you know, hear about you, you, you haven't got enough awareness. And the market's so competitive right now, and everyone's just fighting for attention. Yeah. And this is where, you know, I think we really help. We need to be, we need to be prolific in the way in which we approach getting attention. We need to be consistent. We need to build a system in place. And what Ubic essentially does is it helps entrepreneurs saving them time. So a lot of entrepreneurs, when we did these studies before we launched it, right, most entrepreneurs are spending something like 20 hours a week on social media trying to do their thing, uh, which is massive, right? It's like 60 to 80 hours a month. They are spending a lot of money. So those entrepreneurs who do spend money on social media, on editing, on scheduling, on you know, design work, on transcribing, on doing subtitles, on whatever it is, right? They then spend up to 1,500 quid a month. So between sort of 800 and 1,500. And then in terms of impact, they're not getting the cut through. They're not getting um, the traction they want by their audience. So we basically created this product, which reduce the time people spent from about 60 to 80 hours a, a month to about four hours a month or less. less. Uh, we reduced the, the, the amount they were paying from about 1500 to about 300 to 500. And we reduced the, or we increased the impact they were making from not many people hearing about them because they weren't that consistent to suddenly getting 10, 20, 30 times as many video views. And so our big focus is on video content. So you know, I, I always say to people, you know, a picture says a thousand words, but a video says a thousand pictures, right? Yeah. And so if you really want to build trust, you've got to, you've got to use video content. And so having video content like you're doing with this podcast or other things where you're doing face to cam and being prolific with it is what gets trust. It's being seen in multiple places everywhere. It's being yeah. ubiquitous. Mm-hmm. And I think when you do that, you're in a position where, you know, you, you are, you're starting off the relationship with the person in front of you in the right way. You're giving value. You're not selling. You're building trust. You're showing value. You're giving value. You're showing trust. And then at the end of that, it's like, okay, now you know me. We can retarget you with some sales ads and you can see what we can actually do and work together professionally, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I I absolutely love it because like you were saying, saving time, you know, it's the way I looked at it for me is that kind of stuff doesn't excite me. I Mm. 
I, I do go on social media. I still add a lot of my reels and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of building up my TikTok at the moment. So I've kind of got a bit of a social media challenge happening and I'm focusing heavily on TikTok. Um, and I still will do things like that. However, I if I've got a busy week doing my coaching calls and creating my content or even doing treatments, I can do something I enjoy and earn more money rather than thinking, fuck, I need to... I've not put on Facebook today. I've not done my Instagram. And then I have to then sit and do it. And then I think, oh, God, what mm. do you want to talk about? You know, I li- I-, I love Ubiquitous. Like, genuinely, yeah. I will spend one morning every month creating my content. What do I want to talk about this month? It, it also it makes me accountable. And it also makes me plan ahead on four weeks ahead on topics. I think, right, yeah. what are my topic points? What are my points that I want to share? And then I repurpose as well. Like these go on my Google business page. These go on my website. So I even use what you guys produce for me and repurpose that as well. And I know that I'm covered. I know that my social media for one month is done. Like yeah. all I have to do is engage with people. Um, and a lot of people will say, well, I haven't got the funds to do that. Okay. I haven't got the money to spend on social media. But when you flip it around and look at the money you could be earning for the time you're spending, it's it's win win, yeah. right? Yeah, exactly. And this this is it. This is the entrepreneur's bet, right? It's how much time you're spending right now on creating content, sixty hours a month. Okay. Well, if someone said to you, "I can give you, I can I can reduce that from sixty to fifty nine for five hundred quid a month," then let's let's quickly do the maths on that, right? If you if you were going to bring up a calculator on my phone right now. You're just spending 60 hours and you're doing 500. You're, you're basically working for eight pounds an hour, right? So do you think that you can, do you think that you can earn more in your business with the extra 59 hours? You know, even, 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 even if you just spent an extra 10 hours, then chilled out the rest of the time um, or engaged with your customers more or something, right? So that you weren't yeah. as stressed. And, um, you know, it's, it's like, well, if I said to you, okay, I want you to, instead of spending 60 hours on social media, I want you to spend two hours on social media creating content i want you to spend um let's say eight hours on engaging with people who engage with your posts throughout the month mm-hmm. right replying comments dming that sort of stuff and the other 50 hours i just want you to do sales calls right you're only allowed to do sales calls so that's something like 12 hours 12 and a half hours a week of sales calls right something you could do two and a half hours every afternoon because you're saving that social media time. Do you yeah. think you'd end up making more than 500 quid a month if you're doing 50 hours of sales calls? And, and it's just the reason people say, when people say, oh, I can't, you know, I can't afford that or whatever. Well, firstly, it's a scarcity mindset thing. And it doesn't matter at what level you're at with your business. That is a question you'll constantly ask yourself until you evolve past that question, right? Um, you know, I can't, I, you know, I can't afford 500 quid social media. Okay, I can't afford the 2,000 pound a month employee. Okay, I can't afford the 50 grand refurb on the new location. Okay, I can't afford the 1.5 million pound um, buyout of the new acquisition I'm doing. I can't afford the 10, 10 and a half million pound um, acquisition I want to do with that company, right? And the, what it comes down to is a lack of resources or a, a lack of leverage, mm-hmm. right? And what, in order to get resources and leverage, you need to change your mindset. And so a lot of people come into this thinking, I can't afford 500 quid a month. Well, actually, most people could go to a bank like MBNA or Tesco, get a 0% credit card and get, get £5,000 easily with a very basic credit score. So with no repayments in the first six months. So here's an idea. If you're saying you can't afford something, and this, again, is down to everyone's own risk tolerances, right? Yeah. Uh, but this is something I did. I, I said to myself, I can't afford. It was, a, it, was a, it was a course, actually. I think it was a dent course. You know, I said I couldn't afford it or something like that. And it was about £6,000. I got a 0% credit card. Um, paid paid it up front, six thousand pounds, and then I had something like twenty four months to pay it back. But I, you buy yourself then an extra, an extra what, sixty hours times twelve months, right? Do you think that with twelve months of sixty hours of sales activity, you can make more than six thousand pounds? The answer is yes, and it basically comes down to the entrepreneur bet. The entrepreneur bet is I'm going to invest money or I'm going to take risk in the pursuit of making more money, right? And the that, you know, if you look at the definition of entrepreneurship, let's let's Google it right now, right? Like define entrepreneur. I bet it says something about risk and money. Risk, delegation. A who sets up, here you go. A person who sets up a business or businesses taking on financial risk in the hope of profit. 
So mm-hmm. this is the entrepreneur's bet. Yeah. The question you're asking yourself is whether or not I can afford it. The answer is yes. The question should be, how can I afford it? How can I afford right? it? Yeah. And that, yeah. Is, that is a question that will plague you throughout your life as an entrepreneur, if you see yourself as an entrepreneur, not a sole trader, until you evolve through it. Yeah, yeah. I think that's really important. Like when I um, I do obviously business coaching and help obviously people scale their beauty business up. And one of my basic packages, let's say it's three and a half thousand pounds. Okay. Um, and most people that come on board, obviously they have that, they, they have that scarcity. They think, oh God, three and a half grand. Can I pay for that? You know, I'm only earning a hundred pounds for doing a set of eyebrows. But if if people don't take that move and actually invest, mm. they're also not accountable to take action to take their business forward. And that's another huge thing that I found with the people that I coach. They're like, you know what? I've invested three and a half grand now. I've got to make this work. I've yeah. got to show up weekly. I've got to do what SJ is telling me to do. And I, I believe that these people that I coach, they probably would get there eventually. Like one of my, one of my clients said, since she's been with me, she's ran a marathon and not done a 10K run because she knows she would have got there. But in, in such a short time, in 12 weeks, she's five, four, four times her earnings. She's developed an online coaching pro, uh, platform. I've got her over the fear of getting on camera mm. because I'm, I'm telling her to do it. And she's touching base with me every week and I'm making her accountable. And she's like, three and a half grand is nothing now. Like genuinely, yeah. that's pennies. Whereas yeah. at the time she couldn't, she couldn't afford it. She had to rob Peter to pay Paul. Like you said, the, it's, it's about how you can afford it. She didn't have three grand to set in her bank account to pay me, but she's like, you know what? I'm going to find it. And now I've really struggled to find it. I've got to make this work. I've got to work on the business. I've got to do what I've set myself up to do. And yeah. this is what people, like you say, people are scared of taking that risk. But once you take a risk like that, a financial risk, and put it into your business, you will make it happen because it's not just a 50 quid, you know, transition. You know, you're investing massively. Yeah. And it's and it's one of those things where it's just a learning process, right? So, you know, you do it once and you're like, you have something to refer back to where you said, actually, I did take that risk. You know, and, and risk is a funny thing. And it's very, it's very much linked to imposter syndrome as well, I think, where people think, you oh. know, I'm not, I'm not actually cut out for this or, you know, I feel, I feel uncomfortable. And the way I look at imposter syndrome in particular is imagine you're in a car, right? You've got a, you've got a, you've got a car and it can go quite fast, but you're typically going like 30, 40 miles an hour and you're, you're comfortable there, right? 30, 40 miles an hour, but the car wants to go faster. And there's a part of you that's like, I wonder if I could go faster. And then you start going faster. And the car starts accelerating and you, you're whizzing past the street, right? And suddenly you're getting into the red. It's revving so much you're in the red. The car starts shaking a little bit and you start getting nervous. But that sport mode, that's the point at which you want to be operating. When it gets to the point where the engine light comes on, you've gone too far. And that's when you need to kind of circle back and upskill because you're not ready for it, right? Where you're okay, like, you're literally yeah. burning out. Do you know what I mean? But you want to try and be in that, in that red zone. You know, so you accelerate right up into that point. So you start feeling nervous. You're like, actually, you know, it's a bit like the high performance zone, like we do with martial artists, right? If you look at the high performance zone, ultimately, when people leave their comfort zone, they need that to grow. Yeah. So you need to leave your comfort zone to grow. We all know that. But people leave it at that. They don't actually study this. If you look at the, 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 the comfort zone, it's like a circle and you leave the comfort zone and you get into what's called the high performance zone. And within the high performance zone, you're doing something that's within your ability, but that feels very uncomfortable. And then if you, if you stay there, you perform whatever it is you need to perform. You then go back to the comfort zone. You're like, actually, I can do it. And so your comfort zone expands. Yeah. But a lot of people go into the high performance zone, then go past it into the hyper anxiety stage. And then when they go into that, they're doing something which is outside of their abilities, which they can't perform and they eventually fail. And then they go back into the comfort zone and it shrinks. Yeah. And so the trick here is finding that red, right? On the, on the revs, right? Get into the red, not the engine light. Yeah. Get, into the, get into the red, get used to being uncomfortable, feeling like you're, you're breaking it a little bit and then coming back in, stabilize, calm down and then repeat the action. And yeah. it's incredible. It's incredible when you do that, how this zone just starts opening up yeah. and it changes the way you think. Yeah, definitely. You know, I've, I always say, you know, only only good shit happens when you're at your comfort zone. Like yeah. you, you'll die in your comfort zone. You know, we are all designed to, um, 
to progress, to expand, to learn, to evolve. And we all can just sit in our comfort zone. Um, but especially entrepreneurs, you know, if you want to make something of yourself and your business, you, yeah. have to, you have to feel the fear and do it anyway. Like, yeah. you know, it, it, entrepreneurship, I've had many, I just told you before we came on, I've had a very, very hard nine months um, in my personal life. And I'm now fucking menopausal. Like, I'm too young for that kind of shit. So, and which is affected massively because I'm a, I'm quite a confident person. I'm not afraid to get on camera. Um, I'm very focused, very dri driven. But once you kind of hit the perimenopausal stage, you start having mood swings. You start getting brain fog. You procrastinate more. And I've had the doctors. I'm like, look, I can deal with all the other side, the, the kind of like the physical side of perimenopause, but I can't, I cannot get used to my head not being how my head should be. I'm like, give me hormones, give me patches, yeah. give me whatever yeah, yeah, yeah. I need. Um, and also, this is the thing that I find, a lot of people that I coach are similar age to myself. So they are going to that stage where, you know, mentally, hormonally, things are all a little bit off balanced. Um, but the solutions for that. And I just think, you know what, it's, I, I, do you think people care too much what other people think? This is what I think re is really, really bizarre. Like, not necessarily caring what other people say, but caring what other mm. people think. Yeah. And often times people that they don't even know. Yeah. Like, genuinely, you get people that's, oh, well, I can't do that because of, you know, what, what my, my, my dad's brothers, sisters, uncles. Yeah, I, think, I, think it's, I think it's one of the biggest reasons people don't do the, thing they sh the things they should do. Right. And, and I think I think the 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 hack here is it's a real superpower to not care what people think about you, because, you know, ultimately that if you didn't care what people thought, then you would live a happier life closer to your values, being more authentic and doing the things you want to do. Right. Mm -hmm. But we restrict ourselves so much because of this imaginary fear of social rejection, which is a real caveman fear. And for a lot of people, it's worse than the fear of death. Right. Because it's. It's like, you, you know, you, if you're rejected by the tribe, you know, you're kind of hardwired to, to see that as, as a, you know, worse than death fatality, right? But the, um, the way I see it is this. Every time you walk into a room, just assume that everyone hates you, right? Assume that everyone hates you and just don't care anyway, right? And yeah. I know that sounds strange. Like, I, I just assume that 30, 40% of people just hate me. And it's funny because we do such we do such wholesome work out there. We work with kids to raise their confidence. Do you know what I mean? It's like we're not we're not bad people. We're good people, and we still get trolls. And so what I what I've realized is that if I just assume people just don't like you anyway, you've got this ability not to care. And so you're in yeah. that you're in that kind of frame of mind where it's like you're gonna do your thing anyway, right? Some yeah. people will like you. You know, thirty percent of people will hate you. Thirty percent of people will. Uh, be kind of neutral but just not really interested 30% of people will really like you and the other 10% uh, of people will be a raving fan right yep. and whenever you go into a room or you on your social media or you're doing ubic stuff you're making your videos just assume that you're speaking to that 10% yes right you know that the other 90% whatever really especially the bottom 30 you're going to hate you anyway yeah right and the funny thing about that is it's often the people who are often closest around you that, that don't particularly yeah. like you <laughs> <laughs> they, 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 they want, they like, they like their image of you. But as soon as you start breaking out of that, it's like, well, oh, like, yeah, because it reminds like them that, that box, you yeah, know, it reminds them that they're not where you yeah, are. Yeah, remind, so it can remind people of their own failings. Yeah, and so, and so, just you know, just assume, just what should drive you is that you're speaking to the ten percent. Yeah, and what you should assume is that there's a, there's a bottom thirty percent who won't like you anyway, and it shouldn't detract you from your values and your authenticity and what it is you want to do in your life. Yeah, yeah. See, I always say when I when I'm coaching uh, my beauty entrepreneurs, I always say because a lot of people are are scared of getting on camera, they're scared of putting the message out there because of the fear of rejection, everything else. And I always say to them that you need to not be selfish in terms of I'm scared, I'm scared to go on camera, I'm scared of going live. What will they say? Do I look okay? Blah blah blah. Yeah. You need to think of that that 10%, like you said, 10%, they need to hear what I say. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is for yeah. them. Them people right there, I can help them create the most perfect permanent makeup. Like I can help my 10% scale their business. So I don't really care. Like I go on camera in my group with first thing in the morning in my PJs, no makeup, no hair. I literally don't give a shit no more because it's like I've got a message or um, 
something I want to share right now. And that 10% need to hear this to yeah. help their business. So it's not about my image. It's not about my look. It's not about that moment that I'm about to go live or whatever. It's about that 10% that need yeah. to hear. It. So if you switch it on to they need to hear my message and take the selfish aspect out of it, then you will then deliver. And that's what I say to all my people that I coach. And do you know what? It's it's funny, isn't it? Because you know, they're, you're, you're saying that they, if they were to go on stage, they're, they're worried that people won't like them. And they wouldn't have that fear if they just assumed everyone didn't like them. If um, the, the reason they've got that fear, right, is because they're assuming people like them yeah. or they haven't got anything against them before they go on the stage. People have things against you just by the way you look. People dislike you just because of your hair or your face or your clothes, right? So like you're, win you're, you're fighting a losing battle if it's, if it's trying to get people to like you is your, is your mission. But yeah. if you go on the stage and you're like, most people here don't like me, but there's five people out of these 200 people and I'm going to change their life and I'm doing you this for them. It. Then, it's, yeah. then it's like, cool, that's a powerful energy. And um, it's, you, you have a bit of like swagger as you get on yeah. stage because <laughs> I've, been, I've been at some talks where there's been an atmosphere in the air where it's, you know, it's not particularly nice. And it, you, know, you kind of go on there with a bit of, a bit of like swagger energy. You're kind of like, you know, right, I'm just going to own it anyway, even if you don't like me sort of thing. And it's quite funny, but... You know, I, I, you got to you got to be careful not to go too far with this. Yeah, not not too cocky. Come on, Sam. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to get too cocky with it, right? Yeah. But you want to you want to try and be authentic and speak directly to the people you care most about, right? And yeah. and looking at it like, who can I really help here? And even when you're looking at a lens, right? So if I'm doing my face to cam stuff, and I'm, or you're doing your you're on your phone, or you're doing your lives, whatever it is, I really try and picture someone who's who's waking up in the morning, looking at that video, and you know they've they've been up. All, all night worrying about their kid who's being bullied and they know they've got to send them back to school that day and their kid's going to get bullied again. And they know that's going to happen and they're in bits about it. And they, don't know, they don't know what to do. You know, I'm, I'm speaking about this, the subject of bullying. I'm, I'm looking directly in their eyes as I hold this phone and I speak to them about it, right? Yeah. I think that comes across in your content as well. If you put that kind of love and energy and passion into what you're doing, it comes across and, and people then, you know, they, they, they very much align with that and you become more authentic. Yeah, yeah. See, I actually had as well, um, and this obviously just shows how, um, well, how I don't give a shit how people think. I actually had a, um, I think I put, put something on 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 TikTok, um, and somebody said, like a man. Oh, I thought that was a man. And I genuinely took it as a compliment because I thought <laughs> my back must look good then. Like, yeah. like the first I read it, I'm like, oh, damn. So I looked at the video, I'm like, yeah, my back does look good. But then I was getting loads of messages from my friends saying, oh, are you all right? I'm like, yeah, did you see my back? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That literally <laughs> was the mindset that I was in straight away. You know, you will get. It's a, it's a perspective thing. It's yeah, a, it's a perspective thing. You yeah, know, really and I think what happens is what also people need to understand is the bigger you the, the bigger you get online. So when you're starting to be your big twist, you're starting to be everywhere, and you're starting to build up that online presence. The percentage there's going to be more people that don't like you. You know, yeah. so your lovers are going to grow, but your haters are also going to grow as well. And, and, and here's here's the other thing: like, um, a lot of people are worried they put a video up and no one likes it or views it or whatever, right? And then I went through that because you know we get millions of views on our content every single month, but it's through paid ads because we've scaled the business through paid ads. And I, I've never really bothered with organic. I was like, well, what's the what's the point in doing organic? You know, when I when I know that I can put twenty thousand pounds into this box, paid ads, and out pops fifty thousand. Yeah. you know organics like who cares and um, we've done basic organic but not to the level we're doing now and and i've really learned that when you focus on your organic essentially within three to five years you could get the same reach which saves you that twenty thousand pounds a month so you're basically building this this brand which is then valued at twenty thousand pounds a month because of what you can do with it and so you know it's a long game there and so the the uh, it's if you look at a lot of hormozy stuff it's it's volume it's volume it's consistency and so that's what I'm doing now. You know, I post uh, something like seven reels a day. Uh, yeah. I do five podcasts a week. Uh, that's yeah. across about 14 platforms. So we do about 550 posts every single week. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I've got six months of content like that already made, ready to roll yeah. out. Um, yeah. But with the help of you, Bic, and, and the Shield guys who do all my content, I'm a customer for Shield as well. Um, you know, they, I spend three hours every week doing that. 
Yeah. You know, that's that's podcasting in person. That's um, going through some of the content they've made, checking it, that sort of stuff to make sure it's exactly on point. Utilizing chat GBT for some of the descriptions and that sort of stuff. So leveraging some AI really helps as well. God, and I then, you know, cool. And I, I see it like a two to, I see it like a 36 month plan. I'm expecting nothing. And sometimes I'll post something. When I first started posting one reel a day, I was like, this is, I normally post one a week, right? So I was doing it one a day and I was getting like 30 views and I was like, oh man, this is embarrassing. Right. And so I, uh, I basically just stayed consistent one a day. And eventually that became 2000 views every day for each video. Yeah. And then I was like, right, well, I'll do two, two videos a day. And suddenly bang, the algorithm was like, oh, we're not, we're not happy with you now. So we're just going to shoot you back down to 50 views a day. And so you're like, oh my God, you sort of panic. And then they got up to 1,002, you know, to 2,000 to 3,000 views per day for each video. And now I'm doing seven a day. It's like mm, straight back down again. But I, wow. I get the process, right? It's like yeah. you, you do that. And then the algorithm takes a few weeks to kick in. And then you start getting, you know, when I, went, when I went from two videos to seven videos a day, we went from having 1,500 views or so average per video to having about 50 to 100. And now we're up to about 200 to 300 per video. And I know that within, you know, another month or two, that will then be 1,000 to 2,000 per video. Yeah. So we're then getting, you know, 7,000 views per day on each platform, um, which is, is massive, really. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And I think, like you said, the main, thi the main thing is consistency, showing up as the real you and being creative, not following everyone else. You know, what is your message? What do you want to share? Um, and consistency, you know, people will yeah. set off and think, you know what, stuff it, I'm going to do seven reels a day, they last for a week and then they stop. Um, yeah, you've got to be consistent. Got... Consistency is everything. Like, yeah. you know, I, I said to myself, I'm not going to start a podcast unless I can commit to 36 months. And yeah. this, and the podcast is massive. It's like five, five episodes a week, yeah. right? And so, wow. you know, I've got, a, I've got a system in place where I'll do a deep dive like this, you know, eight deep dives at the beginning of the month, bang, done. Editor films it, takes it off, it's just done. Yeah. And, you know, the next, you know, every Wednesday, I've got uh, my assistant, my EA, Sarah, she books in um, two live interviews every week with incredible people who come, who come to our office. The Shield guys are there filming it. I literally rock up, have a nice chat and leave. That's just built into my weekly routine. I've come routine, to your right? office in Dubai. You should I come. As well. <laughs> You've been? No, I should. I'm saying I'll come. I'll just tip up at office in Dubai. I can <laughs> <laughs> yeah, come along. And so then there's, then there's other things, right? Where it's like, okay, well, we do, we do podcasts for kids as well. So we've got 50 stories that we do for kids before they go to bed about character development and stuff. Oh, fantastic. Which teaches the, teaches the, we call it Matt Chats. It's the same five minute story that we do at the end of um, every single uh, class across the War Academy around the world in every country. 4,000 kids that week will listen to this story about courage. And what it means to have courage and how we can how we can have courage and this sort of stuff, right? And so then the um then it's like everyone's aligned to this one thing. And it's really cool. So we've got this mixture of stuff. We've got deep dives, we've got um live interviews, we've got mat chats and so on. And we we make kind of five uh, podcast episodes a week on that. We also do vlogs. So I've got a whole media team who do a behind the scenes documentary on yeah. every single month on something we're doing. So we've done a competition, uh, we've done uh, we went to like a laser tag thing as a team with 30, 40 of us there. We filmed that and made a little documentary out of it. We've done, we've done um, what, who we hire, how we recruit. We've done that. We've done a black belt grading, what that looks like. Yeah. Uh, we've got, you know, at the moment, I'm, I'm running a 400 person event in February called the World Championships, the Warrior Worlds, where we're bringing in, you know, kids from around the world, from orphanages, from slums, from homeless shelters. So I'm in the process of getting 40 passports together um, to these kids who have never left the village to bring them all in to this 400 person event, where they're then going to be competing, um, you know, on, on, you know, with their, with the um, embassies from their country, walking in with their flags and all this sort of stuff. And it's like, yeah, we'll turn that into a documentary. And so when you look at the content we're making, we're just telling stories all the time, right? Yes, we're telling exactly. stories about the work we're doing and the, the impact we're trying to make. So, you know, if, if, business is a lot about storytelling. If you're the founder, you should be telling stories all the time. Yeah. And people, people, that is where people are going to build the know, like, and trust with you. Okay. People mm. will not build that know, like, and trust by, with you by just sharing before and after photos, you know, the amount, especially in the beauty industry, like you probably don't follow any kind of like Instagram accounts, things, you know, related with the industry, but 
they never have a photo of themselves the logo the logo yeah. the instagram photo is, a, is it, sorry it's just a logo it's never a face and yeah. you scroll through and it's before and after before and after before and after before and after it's boring i don't even know nobody knows who this person is nobody knows the knowledge they've got you know the their experience you know what is their special source what is their niche who is their ideal client there's no value or knowledge shared at all yeah. and in a competitive industry why are they going to pick their, them over you they're only going to pick you because they want to invest in why do you do what you do why do you do what you do what's the true meaning behind what you're doing right you know why do you exist what stories do you have of, of people's lives that you've helped even if it seems minor to you you tell a story about how you know you improve someone's eyebrows and suddenly they had more confidence and they you know they went out there and they've been struggling with that for ages and and it's like well actually a lot of your audience will probably be like oh, i have that same problem yeah you know and yeah. so it's just it's just telling telling stories and then seeing what people are enjoying and going down that rabbit hole more yes right like one of the one of the things that i found is you know i, I talk a lot about and um, participation medals and i'm like I, I disagree with participation medals i think it it develops young people into being very entitled and expecting to win and i talk a lot about how losing is so important and we've got a society that bubble wraps kids and doesn't let them lose anything um, and and we've, we've devalued failure when failure is just such an important process of life and you know otherwise adult hits us you know adult life hits us with full force and so i i talk about this sort of stuff i did one little video and you know, people really liked it. And I was like, well, I'll do, do another one. And that one got 20,000 views on TikTok. And then we did another one. And so then we, t then we was like, well, this works. Let's turn this into an advert, right? Yeah. So then we'll get 500,000 views on it. So it's sometimes I use the organic stuff to then see what works and vice what versa. Works. And so you've got, you've, got to be, you've got to look at it as testing everything all the time, yeah. right? But then that, that yeah. consistency is so important. Build it into your normal routine, everything you do. Don't start something and then stop or you just, you just turn off your audience. Yeah. See, I love that, that you just said about, uh, about kids learning to fail. Um, mm. we was, uh, the adults could learn a lot from that too, actually, couldn't they? They could. We was, uh, <laughs> I was at my daughter's sports day, her first sports day. She's five. Um, she actually came first and second in everything. She's an absolute animal. She's amazing. <laughs> um, she's, she's a beast. She's just, oh, she like picks up spiders and she, she had this huge spider with all these red, running across her like this. She's, she's, she's an animal um but the guy at the beginning uh, her teacher stood up and says right don't know how other schools do it but there's only gonna be a first second and third place yeah. kids need to learn that they don't win everything in life and then, and then he just walked off and i think i was the only parent that was like yeah yes. yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 ama it's amazing how much pressure schools get to, to you know to award everyone for everything in the, in the war academy what we do is we believe that you should reward courage and it takes kids courage to, to turn up to a martial arts competition. So we've got three different types of competitions, Winter Warrior, Summer Summer, and, and, the, and the local champs, right? So they all get a different T-shirt for whichever competition they've gone to. But medals and trophies only go to those who actually win out of their category. Yeah. And so I think that's, that's really important, right? Yeah. You, you, know, you, can't, you can't reward someone with the same as the, the winner. Otherwise, you create this system whereby the winner gets a feeling of what's the point because I'm going to get it anyway, yeah. and the loser gets this feeling of entitlement because they know they're going to they're going to get it anyway. So what happens is your your top performer and your worst performer then become the same, and it's the same in business when you if you know if the if the team does really well and you give everyone a promotion or everyone a pay rise or everyone a bonus rather than saying well you did really well so you get a big bonus. You actually underperformed, so you're you're getting you've got to work harder, and you know you get disciplinary or whatever, right? If you just if you just ignore it all, what you'll find is these guys lose interest, and these guys uh, are just like, well, I can just I can just sink into the crowd, and so yeah. it's the best way to you know create this neutral low performance culture, yeah. And yet we teach our kids that way, and it for me it's just mind blowing. Yeah. Why do we Why do we teach young people? that they, they need to be protected from fear. And, and ultimately, it comes down to a parent's courage. When I look at um, parents, and I look at this term helicopter parenting in particular, right? It's, it's an interesting um, concept because I believe that parenting is, is basically the balance of two things, protection and empowerment. And when you look at protection, it's the most important thing because obviously we need to protect our kids from harm, from all this sort of stuff, right? But that's kind of a given as a parent. Like, if you're not protecting your kid, what are you doing? So, you know, you need to protect your kid. But the other thing is empowerment is a form of protection, but it's not protecting them 
in the immediate sense. It's protecting them from the, the obstacles and the, the challenges that life's going to throw at them later on. Yeah. So ultimately, empowerment is about developing their character so that you can improve the decisions they make tomorrow. Yeah. Right? And so often some of the, the, you know, if we talk about self-defense, it's like the best thing you can do to, to, to teach a child to learn to protect themselves is not necessarily how to block and how to strike and, you know, defend themselves. It's, it's more so how to teach themselves from the negative thoughts they might have or the, the toxic behavior they, they might go and do or the, you know, the, the, the peer pressure they might experience or how to protect themselves from um, imposter syndrome or worrying what people think or making the wrong uh, decision. So these are character traits, yes. right? So, so for me, it's, you know, empowerment is a, you know, it, it's, a, it's, it's all about character development. So yeah. I, I, know, I, know that, I know that we've got to finish up soon, but I, I would just kind of finish on, when, it, when you're looking at parenting, it's this balance of, of um, empowerment and protection. And there's yeah. typically two energies in a, in a relationship which work on that, right? And, and it's funny because uh, for a lot of people, the mum has got such a bond with the child from birth, right? That they've grown this living thing that their main focus tends to be the protection. And yeah. then the kind of masculine energy tends to be the, the empowerment where it's like, well, I've got, to, I've got to try and encourage you to let go slowly. And especially for mums with sons, I've noticed it's, it's like the world's longest breakup, right? I look, <laughs> I, look at, I, look at my, I look at my wife with our son and I'm like, this is going to, this is going to take a while. I mean, uh, while. Eventually, eventually he's going to be 40 and, you know, she'll still be there. But, um, um, but ultimately it's, it's, it's that teamwork, right? And so I've, yeah. you know, I've got a real soft spot for, for single mums and we, we actually do a lot of scholarships for single mums, a lot of, a lot of help with single mums and single dads. Um, but typically these days, you know, it's, it's the mum, single mum who's then looking after the kids as the main carer. And so, you know, it's, it's like they, they, they're struggling with that balance a lot of the time. And if you don't necessarily have that at home, with a with a with a with a mum and a dad, then often it helps to go to a martial arts club or something where you've got that energy, yeah. right? Yeah. You've got that energy which is trying to empower them, is trying to help you as a parent also evolve. Because uh, yeah. that's ultimately what parenting is, right? Parenting, just like martial arts, is this yeah, journey of self yeah, I, I'm a single parent, but I've probably got more of the masculine energy. But I think that's yeah. because of my entrepreneurship background. Yeah, and, 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 and that's and that's really parents. interesting, isn't it? It's like especially especially single parents who have been through a lot, they have to they have to kind of balance both energies. Yeah. I think, I, I've got so much respect for that because I think that's so difficult to do. You know, I think that it takes so much courage yeah. as a, as a mum in particular, I think dads, for some reason, because they tend to have more masculine energy, most dads, then it's, it's easier for them it's to easier. say, right, yeah. you know, you need to do this, get out there, off you go. Um, but for a mum who's created this living thing and now has to look after this child and doesn't want anyone to touch it or it to get hurt, has basically got to say, off you go. And yeah. um, Jordan Peterson had a, had a great point about this. He was like, um, a, a mum wants, to, it's, it's their instinct to protect the child. But part of that protection is saying, is to pushing them out, right? It's yeah. to push them away, getting them away from the mum. And the kid can be like, well, it's dangerous out there. And, you know, the mum's like, yeah, but it's more dangerous in here. Mm. After a while, it's more dangerous in here. If you stay yeah. here with me, after a while, you're not going to be able to cope with life. And when I'm gone, there's going to be serious damage because now you're an adult and it's going to hit you with full force. And so that, that really, you know, just like hit my head hard. I was like, wow. Yeah. That, yeah. yeah, it is. Really great way of looking at it. Like, my kids don't have much fear at all. Mm. I am, I am, well, I've just told you about Ripley. Literally she'll be up there picking up spiders and, you know, I'll, I'll never, never molly cod them. If they fall, I'll never go, Oh, you're all right, baby. Yeah. 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 Oh, you know, but a lot, a lot of that's down to self-awareness as well. So you can talk about entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship is, is again, you know, this, this journey of becoming more self-aware. It's like self-development, you know, on, uh, on, at 100 miles an hour, right? Because you've got to learn yeah. so much about yourself to be a good entrepreneur. And so I often find that entrepreneurs, they understand the process of empowerment and therefore their kids benefit from that. Mm. Well, Seb, I could actually chat all day. However, <laughs> I want to... I want to Finish this up, but I want to kind of ask yeah. what, what is next for um, what you allow to share. What is next for you, Warrior Academy, your victuals, your family? Yeah, so, so the, my, a lot of my focus right now is on is on the the Warrior Academy podcast and growing that. Uh, we've got the uh, Warrior Worlds coming up. We've we've got two thousand orphans we're currently sponsoring. I'd like that to be ten thousand in the next eighteen months. Uh, we're scaling the Warrior Academy from a commercial point of view around the world, um, doing really exciting things across the Middle East. Um, so that's, that's a lot of my energy right now. Um, you know, our, our big vision at the Warrior Academy is to have a black belt community on every continent. And wow. we are, we are halfway there 
Uh, we thought it would take us a lot longer to do that. Um, but these things aren't linear, right? They accelerate. Yeah. So it's, it's, a, it's an exciting time for sure. Excellent. Excellent. And also, guys, for anyone that is listening that wants to know a little bit more about Ubiquitous and Shield, um, get in touch with me. I will be putting some links in this uh, podcast and YouTube release anyway, um, or just drop me a DM, join my private Facebook group, and I will tell you more about it. I have been a customer and using Ubiquitous for three years now. Um, you can just search in Facebook for the Beauty Business Coaching Support Group and you can find more info there. Um, Seb, thank you very, very much for joining me for another interview. It's been amazing having you and thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Great to be on. Thank you. Bye, guys. Fabulous.